Operation Ivy Bells challenged the U.S. Navy to use top-of-the-line technology in order to wiretap underwater communication cables found within the USSR's territorial waters. The innovative USS Halibut submarine took divers on a mission so secret that most of the crew involved were not told the truth about what they were doing. The U.S. collected over 10 years of valuable recordings until an American veteran betrayed his country for $35,000 from the KGB. The Halibut Submarine The USS Halibut was a unique espionage submarine used for many top-secret missions throughout the Cold War. The 350-foot-long nuclear-powered machine was similar to the Sailfish-class radar picket subs, but had more storage space and could submerge deeper into the ocean with an underwater speed of over 20 knots thanks to its S3W nuclear reactor, which also gave the submarine unlimited range. The USS Halibut was used as a regular submarine for four years before the Navy placed it in a dry dock at Pearl Harbor to update it and prepare it for special operations. $70 million later, the submarine featured diver hatches, a photography darkroom, and thrusters for keeping a stationary position. A subsequent update in 1968 at Mare Island saw the installation of video and photo equipment, tapping and recording equipment, and saturation diving equipment meant to prevent nitrogen narcosis in divers. More importantly, USS Halibut was adapted to operate two remote vehicles called FISH, with a storage bay going by the nickname of the Bat Cave, and a top-of-the-line mainframe computer for analysis of sensor data. The fish could swim down to 20,000 feet and were equipped with cameras, a sonar, and strobe lights. After the changes, the USS Halibut was assigned to the Deep Submergence Group as a nuclear attack submarine, rather than a nuclear-guided missile one. Secret Soviet Communications The United States had a particular interest in learning about the Soviet Union's intercontinental ballistic missiles and their nuclear arsenal's preemptive strike capabilities. Development of defensive strategies and mechanisms was essential. After the early 1970 discovery of an undersea communication cable used by Russia to link the Soviet Pacific Fleet Petropavlovsk base to the Vladivostok headquarters, tapping it became incredibly enticing. The cable was located in the depths of the Sea of Okhotsk, between Russian mainland and the Kamchatka Peninsula. However, access to the sea was limited for non-Soviet vessels since the Socialist Republic claimed it as territorial waters. The Soviet Navy had even installed devices at the bottom of the sea, monitoring sound to detect intrusion attempts. The challenge was only increased by the novelty of the necessary technology. In her book Blind Man's Bluff, Sherry Sontag stated, quote, No one else was doing underwater cable tapping. This was all brand new. Front U.S. Office of Naval Intelligence Undersea Warfare Director James F. Bradley entered the post in 1966. After discovering the existence of the Soviet underwater communications network, he decided to tap it. However, the Soviets could not learn about the mission, or else it would be compromised. By the time the mission was ready to be launched in the fall of 1971, the Navy had come up with a cover story that was followed through. To justify sending the USS Halibut submarine to the Sea of Okhotsk, they claimed it would be searching for and retrieving the remains of a Soviet SSN-12 sandbox supersonic anti-ship missile for development of countermeasures. Committing to the narrative, U.S. divers collected over two million pieces of debris from one of the missiles and took them back to the Naval Research Laboratory for reconstruction. After reverse engineering the missile from its remains, the researchers were actually surprised to discover it was only radar-guided, rather than using the infrared technology they assumed it had. The front for Operation Ivy Bells actually turned out to be useful by itself. Operation Ivy Bells the changes made to the USS Halibut were at least partially the result of discovering the Soviet communications cable. The potential for gathering intelligence was far too tempting for the Navy to let the opportunity pass by. Captain James F. Bradley Jr. devoted a great part of his time and energy to ensuring that Operation Ivy Bells could be carried out by the end of 1971. He was convinced that the Soviet cable was vulnerable and unencrypted because the depth at which it was found and its proximity to the Russian mainland had served as sufficient defense. He knew that a mission to wiretap the cable would be so risky, technologically challenging, and daring that the Soviets could not possibly conceive it. Relying partially on the technologies made by the Deep Submergence Rescue Vehicle Program of the Navy and secretly redirecting funds intended for that program, he funded the updates to the USS Halibut, giving it the Bat Cave and fishes needed for the mission. Yet Captain Bradley still faced the challenge of ensuring his team could succeed at such a depth in enemy waters. He developed the fake mission goal, which actually had to be completed in order to use it as a convincing front. He was then tasked with figuring out how to send divers 400 feet below the surface for multiple hours. The answer lay in saturation diving. 
By mixing helium and oxygen, divers would be able to stay underwater for longer at deeper depths without suffering from nitrogen narcosis, which happens when nitrogen and oxygen compress due to water pressure, and the buildup of nitrogen in the bloodstream causes a range of symptoms that can end in fatal embolisms. The success of this method, rooted in the lower molecular weight of helium in contrast to nitrogen, represented one of the very first instances of saturation diving, which the Soviets could have hardly anticipated. The next issue on the agenda was establishing the precise location of the 600,000 square mile long cable. It's been reported that Captain Bradley referred to his childhood memories of utility line warning signs posted by the Mississippi River. He was convinced that the Soviets would post similar signs to prevent accidental damage to the cable by fishermen boats and other civilian vessels. His presumption was correct. After arriving at the Sea of Okhotsk in October of 1971, the crew members of USS Halibut located warning signs for fishermen along the shoreline, indicating the area where the cable was. In order to tap the cable without compromising it, they used an induction technique, placing a 20-foot-long apparatus around the 5-inch width of the cable without cutting into it. Additionally, the wiretapping instrument was designed to detach in case the cable was brought to the surface for repairs. The mission was successfully accomplished, with its actual purpose remaining a secret for most of the sailors on board the USS Halibut, since they lacked the security clearance and were only told of the cover story. Intelligence Starting in October 1971, the Navy sent divers monthly to retrieve and replace the recording tapes. The recordings would be handed over to the National Security Agency for analysis. The mission was so successful that the U.S. continued to tap Soviet lines around the globe. AT&T's Bell Laboratories even improved their instruments and created nuclear-powered devices that could gather data from an entire year. While the USS Halibut continued to be operated for these types of missions, other submarines were also used, including the USS Parch, USS Richard B. Russell, and the USS Seawolf, which was almost lost during a tape collection as it was stranded at the bottom of the ocean following a storm and was almost self-destructed to scuttle the ship and the crew. The US was able to collect almost 10 years of Soviet communications. Some have credited the findings for de-escalating the Cold War, as the United States realized just how afraid the Soviets had become of an American instigated attack against them. Navy access to these communication cables was lost when a desperately indebted NSA veteran sold its secrets. Ronald Pelton Ronald Pelton, then 44, filed for personal bankruptcy and three months later resigned from the National Security Agency. Fluent in Russian and familiar with Operation Ivy Bells, Pelton was highly qualified to conduct espionage for the Russians. He was reportedly in $65,000 of debt, which would equate to around $200,000 in today's market. Out of options, he traveled to the Washington, D.C. Russian Embassy at the beginning of 1980 and offered to reveal the NSA's secrets for a substantial amount. After talks, the KGB paid him $35,000 for three years of service. Additionally, he was compensated $5,000 specifically for details on Operation Ivy Bells. Throughout his treasonous employment, Pelton never provided the Soviets with any classified documents, but rather relayed what he knew from memory. The KGB did not respond immediately to Pelton's revelations of wiretapping, perhaps while debating how exactly to respond, if at all. In 1981, Soviet warships traveled to the tap site in the Sea of Okhotsk. This was revealed to the NSA by satellite imaging. The Navy immediately sent the USS Parch to recover the wiretapping device and recordings, but by the time it arrived, the machine was gone. In November of 1985, after 25 years of service, KGB Colonel Vitaly Irchenko defected from the USSR after telling his CIA guard, quote, I'm going for a walk. If I don't come back, it's not your fault. He was only gone for a couple of days, during which he provided the CIA with several espionage leads, among them Pelton's activities. He returned to the Soviet Union, claiming that Americans had kidnapped him and forced him to talk. Pelton was arrested and convicted to three concurrent life sentences in 1986, which meant he would serve them simultaneously under the Espionage Act of 1917. He was sent to the Federal Correctional Institution in Allenwood, Pennsylvania, and moved to a halfway house for the last six months of his incarceration. In November of 2015, he was released on parole after 30 years in prison. As for the Operation Ivy Bell's recording device taken by the USSR, it resurfaced for a display at the Great Patriotic War Museum in Moscow. <laughs> 